Hello everyone. In the world of medical research, two approaches stand out, real-world evidence and randomized controlled trials. But how they are different? What sets them apart? And which one of them is considered the higher and stronger evidence? And how can we bring both of them together in order to achieve better outcomes in healthcare? So this is the question that I will try to answer in this episode. Real-world evidence or randomized control trial? So let's see. Real-world evidence is derived from the real-world data sources, capturing the details of patients' experiences and treatment outcomes, as they naturally occur in various clinical settings. The sources of real-world evidence can be observational studies, can be health insurance claims, patient registries, or even wearable devices that collects patient data on a daily basis. Because of its broader nature and there is no control when it comes to real-world data and real-world evidence, they provide insights into the real-world applicability. In other words, how this data is applicable in the real life scenarios. But because they lack control, they might face challenges in data consistency because they are not controlled. So when we talk about randomized controlled trials, it's in the name. They are controlled, very well controlled. The patients and the investigators in these clinical trials, they follow a strict protocol. And if they don't, they are not included in the data or the results of the study. But for real world evidence, it's collecting data from real world scenarios. Patients going to clinics, patients in an observational non-interventional study, patients who are wearing a watch, Apple watch or something, and this watch is collecting their biological data, sometimes the heart rate, sometimes other specialized wearables, to detect certain markers or certain biomarkers related or signs related to certain specific condition. So real world data, they are collected from various real life situations. So this gives us assurance and insights how applicable they are in real world life or externally. But how consistent the data is because they are not controlled, they are not standardized, one real world observational study, for example, can follow a protocol that is different than another one looking at the same point or at the same research question. So there is no standardization and no control, which raises a question or, or presents a challenge that they are not necessarily consistent in the data. On the other hand, randomized control trials are experiments conducted in controlled settings. They are the gold standards of determining treatment efficacy and safety, and they are at the top of the evidence-based pyramid. So when it comes to the hierarchy of evidence, randomized controlled trials have the highest credibility. Only Systematic reviews that are built out of multiple randomized controlled trials have a higher degree of reliability when it comes to evidence. But generally, randomized controlled trials are the gold standards and they are considered the best and highest resource of evidence. These are highly structured trials and they are very standardized to minimize bias and variabilities. And so they follow very strict protocols. So we can say that they provide reliability, they provide solid data that is very clear to be applicable in this population of the study. However, because of the controlled protocols and the controlled settings, we are not 100% sure of their applicability in real-life scenarios because they have not yet been tested in, in the entire world population. 
And that's why we say they lack external validity or generalizability. So apparently, both approaches, real-world evidence and clinical trials, they have their strengths and also they have their limitations. So how can they come together for better clinical decision-making process? The, the answer lies in the secret word of integration. The right approach when it comes to clinical decision is integrating the data from clinical trials and the observations and insights from the real world evidence studies or observations. That means that by combining rigorous designs of randomized control trials with the, the insights coming from the real world, then we can reach a more brighter and more informed decision-making process. So in the pharmaceutical industry, that's why we always recommend this integrated approach when it comes to real-world evidence and uh, uh, randomized control trials. And we ask our key opinion leaders, partners, and health authorities to develop frameworks that incorporates insights from both approaches, real-world evidence and randomized control trials. So the summary is real-world evidence and randomized control trials both have advantages and limitations and the best approach for us as uh, professionals in the industry or as clinicians is to integrate both approaches and always consider that the ideal scenario is a medication or a treatment strategy or modality that is supported by both the phase two and three clinical trials as well as real world evidence data. I wanted to tackle one important point also because we discussed that uh, in randomized control trials, there is minimal bias because they follow strict protocols, they follow uh, guidance and instructions from the sponsor as well as the clinical research monitors. While these are not available in real-world evidence, so in real-world evidence, it will be more likely to be biased by the clinical judgment or by different approaches in different settings. However, I wanted to clarify that even for randomized control trials, there is a different type of biases. Yeah, of course, they are all unconscious biases, but let me give you an example. Let's say that a, a physician or a key opinion leader is examining a patient and the get, getting feedback about the treatment in normal clinical settings. The patient will tell him that I got some headache during last week. Will the physician or the doctor take the, this as a serious adverse event to the extent that he will report it or he will call the pharmaceutical organization to report that the patient took or felt some headaches during a week on the treatment? I think this is less likely to happen. But if the same physician or doctor in the same, or sorry, with the same treatment, with the same patient, but they are in a clinical trial, they are in the setting of a clinical trial, the physician is more likely to report to this as an adverse event, despite that he may ignore it in the real life situation. Why? Because he is instructed clearly in the protocol that anything that is reported as an adverse event by the patient must be reported. And that's the objective of the clinical trial, to report all the safety aspects as well as the efficacy uh, parameters of the medication. So the settings here can make the physician or the investigator in our uh, case more sensitive to report what he may ignore in the normal clinical settings. That's why always we, when we present uh, data about different clinical trials or when we do some critical appraiser for certain evidence, this comes into question or into the discussion. Was this statistically significant first? And then if it is not, is it because of the controlled setting in clinical trials? So you see, even in controlled settings, still we cannot eliminate the unconscious bias that 
controls the whole scenario of the clinical trial. So I think we covered the points that I wanted to cover in this episode. Thank you very much. Remember that the ideal approach is to combine real-world evidence and randomized uh, control trials in an integrated approach. Thank you and see you soon.